Welcome to the presentation on combining and portraying risk. In this presentation, we will circle back to cover some of the basic risk concepts that can help us to calculate and present a coherent risk estimate. At the conclusion of this presentation, you should be able to do three things. First is to perform the calculations needed to prepare the two types of risk plots. Second is to recognize and apply some of the different options for calculating a total risk estimate. And third is to portray and communicate uncertainty in a way that informs your recommendations. In this presentation, we will highlight some of the characteristics of a coherent risk estimate. We will give an overview of the two types of risk plots. We will provide several options for calculating a total risk estimate, and we will discuss how uncertainty can be portrayed and used to inform recommendations. It is important that we calculate and portray our risk estimates in a way that builds a coherent case for decision makers so that the results can be used to take appropriate actions. There are three characteristics that make up a coherent risk analysis. The first is logical, meaning that the case is supported by clear and sound reasoning. The second is consistent, which means that each part of the risk analysis is compatible and not contradictory. The third is unified, meaning that the information and evidence collectively supports the recommended course of action. Here are the two types of risk plots commonly used in risk analysis to portray the risk and evaluate the tolerability for both individual and societal risk. The plot shown on the left is known as the little fn. This plot portrays the annual failure probability on the vertical axis and the average life loss on the horizontal axis. Diagonal lines on the little fn plot represent equal values of annualized life loss. The diagonal guideline shown on the little fn plot represents the societal tolerable risk limit, which is equal to an annualized life loss of 1 in 1,000. The horizontal guideline shown on the little fn plot represents the individual tolerable risk limit, which is equal to 1 in 10,000 per year. The annual probability of failure is commonly used on the little fn plot as an estimate of the individual risk. This assumes that the most at-risk individual or group will be exposed to the flood and will perish. Risk estimates are typically portrayed on the little fn plot as a collection of points. The plot shown on the right is known as the big FN plot. The big FN plot is a life loss exceedance curve that portrays the annual exceedance probability of life loss on the vertical axis and the corresponding life loss value on the horizontal axis. Note that the exceedance probability on the big FN plot is defined as being greater than or equal to. The diagonal guideline on the big FN plot represents the tolerable limit for societal risk where the product of the F and the N must be less than one in 1,000 for every point on the big FN curve. Risk estimates are typically portrayed as a line or as a step function on the big FN plot. The box in the bottom right-hand corner of both plots is the low probability, high consequence region where risks need to be more thoroughly examined to ensure that the risks have been adequately addressed and are as low as reasonably practicable. Now let's walk through the development of the risk plots. The risk estimate starts with a hazard curve that defines the hazard as a function of the annual exceedance probability. Next is a system response curve that defines the probability of failure as a function of the hazard. These two curves are combined to obtain a curve that defines the system response as a function of the annual exceedance probability. The area under this combined curve is equal to the annual failure probability, which is the little f value that's plotted on the little fn plot. In the next step, the combined hazard and system response curve can be combined with a consequence curve that defines the life loss as a function of the hazard and the system response. The resulting combined curve from this step defines the life loss as a function of the annual exceedance probability. The area under this combined curve 
is equal to the average annual life loss, which is the product of the little f and the little n on the little fn plot. You might also remember that the area under an exceedance curve is equal to the expected or average value. This is the average annualized life loss. The exceedance curve itself is the big FN curve. In an event tree analysis, the, these area calculations are performed using a midpoint Riemann sum, which you might also remember as the rectangle method for estimating integrals or for estimating the area under a curve. Each end branch of the event tree represents the area for one of these rectangles. The total area or the total risk estimate is obtained by summing all the end branches of the event tree, which is equivalent to adding up all of the incremental areas defined by each of the rectangles to obtain the estimate of the total risk. This simplified example demonstrates the event tree calculations for an individual potential failure mode. In this example, the annual failure probability is calculated by adding the failure probabilities for each end branch of the event tree corresponding to the failure mode. The annualized life loss is calculated by adding the product of the probability and the corresponding life loss estimate for each end branch of the event tree. The n value that's needed for the little fn plot can then be calculated by dividing the average annual life loss by the annual failure probability. Remember that the value of the little n on the little fn plot is the average life loss over all of the possible ways that failure could occur for this specific failure mode. Now let's use the same event tree example to go over the calculations for the big fn curve. In this example, the big fn values are estimated for the total incremental risk. Each failure end branch of the event tree corresponds to one point on the big FN curve. We just need to get the values in the correct order and then calculate the cumulative or the exceedance probability values. This can be done by first sorting the life loss values in descending order from the largest to the smallest life loss. Next, we can calculate the cumulative sum or the running total of the corresponding annual failure probability values. The resulting set of points define the big FN curve. Here are the results for the event tree example we just covered. Note that the little FN plot is typically portrayed as a collection of points representing each of the individual potential failure modes and the total risk estimate. The big FN plot is typically portrayed as a step function for the total risk estimate. However, risk estimates for individual potential failure modes can easily be calculated and portrayed on the big FN plot. Let's wrap up our discussion of the risk plots by highlighting a few key concepts and characteristics. First, the two Fs are not the same thing. However, the value of little f will typically be about the same as the maximum value of the big Fs when failures always result in some amount of life loss. Second, Remember that the two n's are also not the same thing. Little n is the average life loss per failure event, and big N is the life loss for a specific failure event. Third, both the little fn and the big fn guidelines are risk neutral guidelines. This means that dams and levees that have the same average annual life loss estimate will generally have the same priority for action. Here are just two more things that are good to know about the risk plots. First, the guidelines themselves are not probability distributions, which means that the guidelines are not interchangeable. The little fn guideline cannot be directly derived from the big fn guideline by taking a derivative. Similarly, the big fn guideline cannot be directly derived from the little fn guideline by taking an integral. The final thing to know is that the value of little n and big N do not necessarily have to be integer values. By definition, little n is an average value and average values do not have to be integers. Although the big N does represent an estimate of the actual life loss for a specific failure event, risk model simplifications are commonly made 
and these simplifications often result in non-integer values for big N. The low probability high consequence region in the bottom right hand corner of the two risk plots requires some special considerations. This example demonstrates the potential for different interpretations of the risk estimate depending on which type of risk plot is used. The total risk estimate shown by the triangle on the left hand little fn plot might suggest that risk is borderline tolerable and potentially actionable. Plotting the individual potential failure modes on the little fn plot can provide some additional context for this total risk estimate. We can see that the total risk is derived from a failure mode that has a relatively high probability and a relatively low life loss, failure mode one, combined with a failure mode that has a very low probability but a very high life loss, failure mode two. The risk plot on the right-hand side might more clearly suggest that the risk is likely to be tolerable and that further risk reduction actions would probably not be cost effective because of the very low probabilities. Just remember that the two types of risk plots can sometimes provide different perspectives on the risk. The approach we use for calculating a total risk estimate for a system first requires that we define a system. In a risk analysis, the concept of a system is scalable. In the following slides, we are going to focus on calculating a total risk estimate for a dammer levy made up of a collection of potential failure modes. However, as we go through these examples, keep in mind that the methods we present can be applied to any type of system and at any scale, such as a river system that is made up of a collection of dams and levees. The failure for an individual potential failure mode requires the occurrence of all of the events that make up that failure mode. Remember that this is defined and calculated as the intersection of the events that make up that failure mode. Multiple potential failure modes typically apply at any given dam or levy. This means that a failure of the system or a failure of the dam or levy can occur due to the occurrence of any one or more of the individual potential failure modes. Remember that risk for the system is defined and calculated as the union of the events or the union of the individual potential failure modes. Here are some of the factors to consider when deciding how to approach a total or a system risk calculation. The two main considerations are the accuracy that you can achieve in your risk estimate and the accuracy that you may need to inform a good decision. There are three basic options for calculating a total risk estimate. The end game is to transform the set of independent potential failure modes into a collection of mutually exclusive failure modes so that we can sum the probability and risk estimates to get an estimate of the total risk. The first and easiest option is to simply ignore the probability and consequences for the joint event represented by the overlapping area and simply assume that the individual potential failure modes are mutually exclusive. The second option is to reassign the probability for the joint event, again represented by the overlapping area, to each of the individual potential failure modes, and then assume that the adjusted failure modes are mutually exclusive. The third option is to explicitly estimate the probability and consequences for each combination of events including the joint event represented by the overlapping area. By definition, these combinations are mutually exclusive events. The first option calculates the total risk by simply summing the individual potential failure modes and assuming they are mutually exclusive. The first option will always overestimate the annual failure probability to some degree because the overlapping area representing the probability of the joint event gets double counted. Screening level risk analyses commonly use option one for simplicity and ignore the potential error. The error will often be small and can typically be ignored in a more detailed risk analysis when the probability of the joint event is relatively small. This happens when the sum of the probabilities for the individual potential failure modes is relatively small or when there are relatively few potential failure modes or when one potential failure mode 
has a dominant probability that is significantly larger than the probabilities for the other potential failure modes. The second option for a total risk calculation makes an adjustment to the probabilities for the individual potential failure modes so that the correct total annual probability of failure is obtained by summing the adjusted probabilities. Hill and his co-authors proposed a simplified approach for making the adjustment that is based on the ratio of the total probability calculated using De Morgan's rule to the total probability calculated by a simple summation. This ratio is then multiplied by the probability for each of the individual potential failure modes to obtain an adjusted probability estimate. Note that this method only adjusts for the probabilities. It does not account for potential differences in the consequences. The third option for a total risk calculation is to explicitly calculate the probability and consequences for each combination that comes from the individual potential failure modes. By definition, these combinations are mutually exclusive, which means that the probability and risk estimates can be added together to get the total risk estimate. This method might be worth considering when the probability of the joint event is either relatively large or when there is a significant difference in the potential consequences for the joint event. Now let's quickly look at a simplified example to see how the three options for total risk calculation play out. In this example, there are three loading intervals and two potential failure modes. Life loss has been estimated for each failure mode individually and for the combination of both failure modes occurring in the same event. The total risk calculations for this example are summarized in the three tables shown on this slide. The changes that occur as we progress through each option are highlighted. For option two, the system response probabilities are adjusted at each loading interval for each potential failure mode. For option three, the joint event of both A and B occurring is included as a separate failure event. Also notice the change in the description of the failure events and the system response probabilities. For example, failure mode A is now defined as the probability of failure mode A occurring combined with the probability that failure mode B does not occur. This allows us to define each combination as a unique event so that we can sum the results to get the total risk estimate. Here are the results for our simplified example. A key concept to remember is that the risk estimates for the individual potential failure modes are typically calculated without making any of the adjustments. The adjustments are only made for the calculation of the total risk estimate. In this example, all three options seem to do a pretty reasonable job of estimating the total risk. This happened mainly because there were only two potential ferry modes and also because errors tend to look smaller on a logarithmic scale. Option one overestimates the annual failure probability a bit because of the double counting of the joint event probability. The value of n is also underestimated a bit with option one because the higher consequences for the joint event are not included. Option two calculates the correct value for the total annual failure probability, but again underestimates the value of n a little bit because of the higher consequences associated with the joint event. Option three does the best job by calculating the total annual failure probability correctly and the total risk estimate correctly. In this example, the differences between the three options is relatively small and probably insignificant. So in these types of scenarios, option one is probably the best option because it is by far the easiest option and also accurate enough for decision making. Now let's move on to talk a little bit about sensitivity and uncertainty. The need for further study is generally justified by evaluating and portraying the sensitivity and uncertainty in a risk estimate. Generally speaking, more study is worthwhile when the uncertainty is high and when more study can actually reduce the uncertainty and when the decision is sensitive to the uncertainty. High uncertainty in and of itself is not a sufficient reason to recommend additional study. Reducing the uncertainty must also have the potential to affect the decision. 
Calculating the uncertainty in a risk estimate typically requires the selection of probability distributions for inputs to the risk analysis. A wide variety of probability distributions is available. A few key concepts to remember is that the selected distribution should be representative of the available data, it should be appropriate for the specific application, and it should also be consistent with the underlying physical processes that we are trying to model. There are many ways that uncertainty can be portrayed and communicated in a risk analysis. Here are just a few examples. Point clouds are commonly used to show the uncertainty in a risk estimate on the little fn plot. Spaghetti plots or a collection of lines can be used to portray the uncertainty in a risk estimate on the big fn plot. Probability distributions and their associated confidence intervals can be used to show the uncertainty in a specific model parameter or a specific assumption. Box and whisker plots are commonly used to show the uncertainty in a life loss estimate. These are just a few of the many ways that uncertainty can be portrayed and communicated. There are also many options to portray the sensitivity of a risk estimate to a model parameter or an assumption. Tornado plots can be used to show the relative sensitivity of each model parameter. The most sensitive parameters are typically the best candidates for further analysis. A variety of simple plots can also be used to show how much a model output might change given a change in one or more of the model inputs. The sensitivity of the risk estimate to a given parameter or an assumption can also be shown directly on the risk plots. In this example, you can see that the risk estimate could vary by about one and one half orders of magnitude depending on how the spillway gates are assumed to operate. Let's wrap things up by summarizing a few key concepts to remember. First, a risk analysis must be coherent, which means that the evidence, data, analysis, risk estimate, and the recommendations must all tell a consistent story. Second, the two types of risk plots can be used to portray risk estimates in different ways, sometimes providing different insights on the nature of the risk. Third, the total risk estimate can be calculated in different ways depending on the accuracy that is needed in the risk estimate and the impacts that accuracy might have on a decision. And finally, the uncertainty and sensitivity in a risk analysis is primarily used to support recommendations for further studies that could be performed to reduce the uncertainty and increase the confidence in the decision making.